Hello ladies, gentlemen, boys, girls, innies, outies and in-betweeners. My name's Dan and welcome back to another Pat Reports. It's Wednesday, May 20th, 2020. In 2013, Wendell Baker was given a life sentence for beating and raping 66-year-old Hazel Backwell and locking her in a cupboard. Baker was 56 at the time and was given a life sentence in a retrial after a judge in a first trial in 1997 wrongly ruled his trial couldn't continue. Baker's life sentence was given initially on the condition that he spends at least 10 years in prison before being eligible for release. Life sentence, 10 years. But it's actually worse than that because following an appeal in 2014, Baker got another two years knocked off his minimum term, taking it to just eight years, which means he became eligible to be considered for release on the 15th of March after beating, raping, and locking a woman in a cupboard, which, had it not been for a concerned neighbour, would likely have seen her die in there. British justice, the best in the world. The parole board, which held a remote hearing to consider the case, said Baker would be subject to strict licence conditions, including curfew and an enhanced form of supervision or monitoring once released. Spokesman from the parole board said parole board decisions are solely focused on what risk a prisoner could represent to the public after release and whether that risk is manageable in the community. We do that with great care and public safety is our number one priority. The Ministry of Justice said, like all life sentence prisoners released by their independent parole board, Wendell Baker will be on licence for the rest of his life and subject to strict conditions and faces a return to prison if he fails to comply. Yeah, because now he's had a taste of free bed and board, pool tables, TV, games consoles, no bills, three meals a day. I'm sure he'd be devastated if he ended up back in prison. This kind of justice for people is really sickening to me. I just don't see why they bother giving a life sentence if it doesn't mean a life sentence. On the 18th of May, I reported about how Dwayne Francis, a pastoral support worker in Lewisham, was stopped and searched by what he called patronising police constable from the Met's territorial support group, with Sean Berry, the co-leader of the Green Party in England and Wales, saying, From start to finish, this incident raises serious questions. Most parts of the Met seem to be focused on engagement and constructive detecting work, with lockdown in place. Sounds like the TSG are just driving around at a loose end, exerting power over not-so-random citizens, indicating that it may have been a racially motivated stop. Well, now we have a London youth worker, Sace Holmes Lewis, who says he was unfairly targeted and has criticised the use of stop and search powers during lockdown. He says he was pulled over in South London while driving to take food to a bereaved friend. Police suspected he was carrying drugs. They stopped me after 45 seconds of seeing me based on my behaviour, he said. I'm not sure what that means, but it's stereoty stereotyping and racial profiling. It's happened to me so many times and enough is enough. He added, the way police acted was overzealous and they should be held to account for their actions. So the question is, are the Met racist? Personally, I don't really go for all that racist malarkey. I think it's now being used more for political reasons than anything else. And my personal opinion is that by giving people the opportunity to call racist when there is an issue, is one of the reasons the citizens of this country are breaking real communities down and creating pockets of types of people. When in fact, we are all the same and should all be treated the same as human beings. In fact, after a bit of research, I've come to the conclusion that although in some places, BAME people are the most likely to be arrested or stopped and searched. For example, in London in 2018, just over half of adults arrested were from minority ethnic groups. However, in England and Wales collectively for the same year, it seems that us honkies are overall most likely to be arrested. Now, this to me makes sense. In certain places, there are large numbers of BAME citizens in some places, making the majority of people in those places. And so you would expect that the majority of police interactions would be with those people because it's statistically more likely that those from the majority group will be stopped. I'm not for a moment suggesting that some people might not like BAME folk, but personally I think those people are a minority. And in fact, BAME folk, like the LGBT community, have been given a weapon to use against people who they might not agree with, and that's hate crimes. By allowing people to attach hate to a crime rather than simply saying it's a crime that could have happened to anyone 
or because someone used a naughty word that the victim didn't like, then makes it seem like more people are racist or homophobic or transphobic for that matter. When in fact, as proven, some police have tried to tell, some people have tried to tell the police that the crime wasn't based on their characteristics, but the police have pushed them to say it was. Why would that be, I wonder? <laughs> I know what I think, but my views are not as important as yours. So please let me know what you think in the comments. 27 boys and men, if you can call them that, aged from 16 to 57 have been arrested and more than 60 electronic devices seized after police in Bradford carried out warrants on addresses across the city after claims that people had been contacting children online and were in possession of indecent images of children. Detective Chief Inspector Alan Weeks said, we urge parents and carers, particularly in the current climate where children are spending more time at home, to regularly monitor their children's devices and report any concerns to the police or partner agencies so these can be investigated fully. Adrian Farley, Executive Member for Children and Families at Bradford Council, said it's a good result that the police have made these arrests. It sends out a strong message to anyone thinking of committing these sorts of crimes that grooming children online will not be tolerated, particularly at this time when children are spending more time online because of the coronavirus lockdown. He said it also shows that when partners and the public let the police know of potential offences, action can and will be taken. Send out a strong message, you say? No, it doesn't. Proper sentencing sends out a strong message. Simply arresting people and letting them go or sentencing people to short jail sentences certainly doesn't deter people from carrying out these types of despicable, life-destroying crimes. The 27 people were questioned and released under investigation or bailed whilst further in, uh, inquiries take place, said West Yorkshire Police. Safeguarding measures have been put in place for 26 children. Police said parents and carers must monitor the children's devices and report concerns during the coronavirus lockdown. Now we all know traffic wardens are the scourge of the roads, unrelentless, soulless, heartless extortionists for the local authorities. But assaulting them or anyone else is definitely a bad idea. Although we would all likely imagine doing all sorts to them, most people restrain themselves from fulfilling that fantasy. Look, you wanna knock him out, you knock him out. I fucking hate traffic wardens. But not 40 year old Alex Owers. Oh no. <laughs> Owers actually attacked the traffic warden who was giving him a ticket for parking illegally outside a cafe in East Yorkshire. Whole Crown Court heard how Owers got the traffic warden in a headlock and made him eat the ticket he had just issued. The court heard how he tried to force the ticket into his mouth and caused his gums to bleed. The civil servant tried to press his panic alarm, but Owers stamped on the mobile phone and kicked him. Owers was also charged with breaching a suspended sentence that he was handed in October for wounding and had previous convictions for assault and an emergency worker and two racially aggravated public order offences. Jailing him for 23 months, Judge Nadim told Owers civil service workers in the form of parking warders will be protected by the courts, as are the police who are doing a very difficult job in very difficult circumstances. Yeah, traffic wardens have got it really hard, haven't they? The message needs to be loud and clear that this sort of conduct won't be tolerated by this court. And yes, you're right, the message needs to be loud and clear, so why is it that he was given a suspended sentence in the first place for wounding someone? No wonder crimes are on the rise, albeit shelved during the lockdown, but if people who commit serious crimes are handed soft sentences or allowed to walk ultimately free from court on a suspended sentence, especially as a repeat offender, what do you expect? Now for something that will certainly upset many of you, especially if you've been a victim of crime. The police are set to drop thousands of drugs, theft and criminal damage prosecutions in an attempt to clear the backlog of court cases caused by the lockdown. Police are being asked to offer out of court alternatives, such as community service instead. Just last week, Ian Burnett, the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales, said the backlog was growing at around a thousand cases a month. 
Sarah Glenn of the National Police Chief Council and a Deputy Chief Constable of Hampshire said that forces should review cases and that some could be handled without people going to court. Which I would say is a breach of Article 5 of the Human Rights Act 1988, your right to liberty and security, namely to be taken to court promptly and to have a trial within a reasonable time. Also Article 6 of the Human Rights Act 1998, the right to a fair trial and possibly a breach of Article 7 of the same which is the right to no punishment without law. The police do not deliver the law, they simply enforce it, or at least that's how it's supposed to be, but now they're being called upon to be some kind of gang of judge dreads. Sarah Glenn said, we all know the criminal justice system was already stretched before lockdown, damaged, I think is more appropriate, before social distancing measures were put in place. Whilst it has had an impact on all agencies, the pressure on the ability of Her Majesty's courts and tribunal service to ensure courts hear cases is even more profound and the backlog is going to build. Technology-enabled justice will only assist so far in this regard. Carolyn Goodwin, QC, Chair of the Criminal Bar Association, told her members the process is in its infancy. It will be slow and cautious, as reported by the Financial Times. Prosecutors have already been told that the most serious cases should be given priority. Ms Glenn added in the letter that new investment was needed in the criminal justice system to avoid years of delays. Is this more proof of our rights being slowly eroded away from us? Let me know what you think. The public inquiry into the death of 36-year-old Anthony Granger, who was shot in a chest in a car in Cheshire by police in 2012, concluded there were catastrophic failings by senior Greater Manchester Police involved in the operation, with a government report saying lessons have been learned to improve armed police operations in the UK. In July last year, Inquiry Chairman Judge Thomas Teague QC criticised senior officers for failing to authorise, plan or conduct the firearms operation in such a way as to minimise recourse to the use of lethal force. The government's response looked at the nine recommendations set out by Judge Teague, including the use of body cam footage and communication of firearms commanders during the post-shooting proceedings, covertly fitting blue lights and sirens on unmarked vehicles, to be used at the point of an intervention and changes to policies and procedures. A spokesman said good progress had been made on the recommendations with significant work to implement changes. It said body-worn video cameras are now a requirement for all armed response vehicle officers and specialist firearm officers when deployed overtly. The National Police Chief Council is also looking at introducing a maximum time for firearms officers to remain on continuous duty. Greater Manchester Police said in a statement it had invested in a significant reform programme to make armed operations safer in Greater Manchester and nationally. Six officers remain under investigation for misconduct by the Independent Office for Police Conduct over the shooting. Now, isn't it a shame that body-worn video isn't mandatory for all police, with penalties for turning it off? Who knows, maybe that way they will all start to behave a little better. On the 14th of April, I reported on PC Simon Bidgood, who was dismissed from Avon as Somerset Police for breaching standards of professional behaviour, including duties and responsibilities, honesty and integrity, and discreditable conduct, after admitting that he added a man he had never met, the partner of one of his colleagues, as a friend on Facebook, and then chatted with him on the social media site Messenger Service whilst he was on duty. Then, serving as a response officer in charge, he used a website to fabricate a text exchange that would appear as if it had taken place between him and the other officer, when it hadn't. Well, it seems the bar for being a police constable has been dropped considerably further, as ex-PC Bidgood is now PC Bidgood again, after he's been reinstated after an appeal due to his barrister suggesting the misconduct panel had failed to consider the context of his actions. So the context of adding someone you don't know the partner of a colleague and then sending fake messages between you and your colleague to your colleague's partner. Yeah, I'm sure the context of doing that is really going to be a mitigating factor. The tribunal held over, over Skype on May 19th heard Mr Bidgood contact, contacted his colleague PCX's partner Mr Y on Facebook to tell him she was a conniving, scheming liar who had been two-timing them and revealed intimate details of their sex life and his mental health. The former child response officer did not have any 
hard evidence of his affair with PCX, so he fabricated a text message exchange, but failed to remove the name of the website, ifaketextmessages.com. <laughs> Nob. When he was found out, he claimed he had tried to replicate previous messages between himself and PCX, the tribunal heard. Representing Mr. Bidgood, Fiona Elder, said the original misconduct panel failed to consider whether the fake messages may have been a reconstruction of an actual message. Context is important, particularly when the person is off duty and not acting as an officer. There's no indication by the panel how it considered that the conversation brought discredit on the police service as a whole, or why it mounts to gross misconduct, serious enough to justify dismissal. Because he's a lying bastard? There's nothing to indicate a fair approach to this matter by failing to address it. They aren't making a reasoned and reasonable decision. Representing Avon and Somerset Police, James Berry told the tribunal that Chief Constable Andy Marsh had resisted the appeal. He said Mr Bidgood as he said Mr Bidgood's behaviour was seriously dishonest and plainly merited a finding of gross misconduct and his dismissal. This was a case where the black where the background was inconsequential given the nature of the misconduct. There was no unfairness. All of the allegations were based on incontrovertible electronic evidence. Utterly utterly ridiculous i mean maybe in another profession this might have been they might have a right to reinstate them but in a profession that requires honesty and integrity people like this shouldn't be allowed this just tears yet another strip of respect away from the tattered remains that the police have left a scottish taxi driver 59 year old stephen mcfadden was waiting on zigzags outside bridgeton health center in glasgow as his frail pensioner passenger was struggling to walk to his car. However, as he pulled away with his passenger, police pulled him over within seconds of pulling away and fined him £100 and gave him three penalty points for good measure. <laughs> There's that good old police discretion again. Stephen, who works for Network Taxis, said, I was stunned. I just said, are you kidding me? I was genuinely parked out, parking outside to help the old guy, not cut corners. He could barely walk. My passenger thought it was ridiculous. He thought I was doing him a favour. He was struggling. The only work I've really been doing is picking up people from hospitals and health centres and this is how we're repaid for doing a little bit of good. He said a parking bay outside the centre was full, so he waited on zigzags next to a zebra crossing with his hazards on for, a few, for around five minutes as the man slowly came down the stairs. But they were pulled over shortly after he drove off from the centre when a man was believed to be seeing a doctor. Now, I fully get that zigzag lines are there for a reason. So in that respect, I'm not condoning his stopping there as such. But the police must have seen him and could have simply pulled up, asked him why he was there. And, you know, and as I've said before, used that good old police discretion to allow the Frau OAP to get his ride home. But no, because police discretion is not used for doing nice things, is it? Police Scotland were asked to comment by media outlets, but, surprise, surprise, they declined to comment. Thames Valley PC Jamie Larman, who, although was a PCSO since May last year and who took a role as a probationary Blue Line gang member in January this year, has quit just two weeks into training. <laughs> well, that didn't last long, did it? But did he quit because he couldn't stand the corruption? the lack of respect from the public or from his colleagues or the fact that the police are now a political force rather than a public service. No, he didn't. In fact, he left because he was caught helping himself to seven fry-ups from his work canteen just one week into his new job. Larman helped himself to the meals from the cafeteria at the Thames Valley Police Training Centre in Sol Hampstead near Reading despite knowing that he wasn't entitled to them for free because he lived less than 20 miles away in Abingdon. In a misconduct hearing documents, it was also revealed that the ex-officer was given a warning last year when he was caught doing the same thing before a training day as a PCSO. Chief Constable John Campbell said it, he had de facto stolen the breakfast from Thames Valley Police. He knew full well that he was breaking the rules. He said he states that the reason for his actions were to build rapport with colleagues who met early for breakfast ahead of training. I consider this nonsense, he said. He could have fulfilled this objective by paying for his own food and not stealing from Thames Valley Police. Mr Campbell said that PC Larman had helped himself to the food 
and had not made any attempt to pay until he was challenged by colleagues on February the 6th. He added, to compound this, there is evidence he behaved similarly as a PCSO. He was fully aware of the force rules and, and that he was therefore not entitled to free food. It was not a mistake as he suggests, it was willful and dishonest. He has no place in Thames Valley Police. If he was still serving, I would have dismissed him without notice. He will be placed on the College of Policing barred list. So he's now banned from ever applying to a job in the UK police force again. Isn't it amazing how some police don't get barred for serious breaches and in some cases criminal charges, but yet this plot, although it was wrong, has been barred from the police for good. I don't know, maybe he proved to the chief constable that he just wasn't corrupt enough and he should have beaten the canteen staff up and robbed the till from the canteen as well, rather than just the food. Maybe then he might still have a job. With so many police being outed for being bent, it's no wonder the government are asking for more to join. In fact, the government's pledge to put 20,000 more police on the streets is heading into a new phase. As of yesterday, TV commercials highlighting policing a central role in a community started to air on television, alongside social media adverts designed to attract applicants from a variety of backgrounds. Yet the government's very own website shows just one background. How incredibly woke of them. The campaign aims to capitalise on what they call the community spirit, shown by the British public during the coronavirus pandemic, which presents an unprecedented opportunity for people to make a difference by joining the police. Home Secretary Priti Patel said, getting more police officers on the streets to keep us all safe is an absolute priority for the British people and this government. Mm, more like a priority for the government. The heroic efforts of officers up and down the country have been crucial in protecting the NHS and saving lives during this pandemic. Mm. No, no it's not. It hasn't at all. Because they didn't even know what they were doing. Hence all 44 charges under the Coronavirus Act are being unlawful. There's never been a better time to join the police to make a difference in your community, she said. Mm. Well, well, I'd say that the best time to join the police was about 30 years ago when the police were at an actual public service. Chairman of the National Police Chief Council, Martin Hewitt, said this TV commercial is an exciting first for policing, informing a wide TV audience that we continue to recruit for police officers. We want everyone to know that we are open for recruitment. The pandemic has presented everyone with new challenges, but it is essential that we continue to build our policing capacity by attracting and training new police officer, officers. Now is a great time to consider whether you could make your difference by joining the ranks. The College of Policing has also recently announced the rollout of new online assessment centres which will ensure that recruitment continues at pace during the coronavirus outbreak. The online assessment process will take candidates through situational judgment tests, briefing exercises and interviews. Forces are already trialling this platform and the service will be available to forces in England and Wales from June. Well, yeah, because there's no learning quite like theoretical learning. <laughs> Who needs real practical learning and assessment? West Midlands Police have taken over the investigation into a murder after a woman's remains were found in a suitcase. I'm sure the family are over the moon that West Mids are taking over from Gloucestershire Police. 27 year old Gareka Kanita Gordon is accused of killing the unknown woman on a date between April the 14th and May 12th at her home address in Birmingham and has been charged with murder. Meanwhile, 38-year-old Wolverhampton man Mahesh Sorathia of Denmore Gardens has been charged with assisting an offender in connection with the case. Detective Chief Constable Rolf said on May the 12th the body of a woman was found in a car. The case is now being managed by West Midlands Police. It's believed to be Birmingham related, so it is us who will be taking on that. Gordon and Sorathia appeared at Cheltenham Magistrates Court on Saturday, but no pleas have yet been entered. Well, it's West Midlands Police, isn't it? Maybe they could just get one of their constables to beat a confession out of the suspect. They seem to like being hands-on. Now, the next report is a cracker. <laughs> You're gonna like this. Police in West Cornwall got a shock after a drone attempting to track a, a suspect through a field spotted a huge penis. 
The penis was so large, it extended the entire length of the field. Police wrote on Facebook on May 16th, it's absolutely amazing what you see from the air, and sometimes we're caught a bit off guard. Whilst in West Cornwall and searching for an offender who'd recently run off from the police, we came across this unusual piece of artwork in a field, taking us completely by surprise. Some social media users joked that it was an arrow to tell the police the offender went that way. One Facebook user said, the best thing is that someone hasn't just done it randomly. They have actively planned this, procured a grass cutting apparatus, then made their way to this field and gave a circumcision, if you will. Another added, must be a hardened criminal. <laughs> but now it's your turn, folks. If you'd have seen this post, what would you have commented? Let me know in the comments here. A house in Stockbridge Village in Merseyside was set alight by arsonists after a convicted paedophile was escorted to safety. The paedophile originally from Birkenhead, which on this side of the water is almost a reason to have your house burned down anyway, is understood to have been involved in a dogging gang who groomed and systematically sexually abused a 13 year old girl in North Wales in 2005. He admitted two counts of sexual activity with a child and taken indecent photographs of a child in a 2006 court case and was jailed for three years. Merseyside police have urged residents to report any information and not take the law into their own hands. Who knows, maybe if these people were dealt with properly then the public wouldn't feel the need. And that's a dig at the courts, not the police this time. Detective Chief Inspector Craig Sumner said this is an unoccupied property, so thankfully no one was injured. However, to deliberately set any location alight is incredibly reckless and risks the lives of homes of anyone living in the vicinity. We are aware of social media comments and rumours locally, and I would strongly urge anyone to report any information directly to the police and not try and take the law into their own hands or share videos or comments that potentially put others at risk. He said, if you have any information as to who was responsible, come forward and we will take the appropriate action. You can see that happening, can you? Protesters in Hove were allowed to carry out their protest after police said they couldn't enforce social distancing by law and instead escorted the 30 or so protesters along the promenade on Hove seafront. Government advice states that with social distancing guidance, it is advised that large gatherings should not take place. But Sussex Police said it would not have had any powers to enforce social distancing at the protest event. But the legislation does say that groups of people larger than two can be dispersed and that's exactly why I say about social distancing because although it's not enforceable in itself, the police have the power to break up groups and also issue dispersal orders under other legislation so by actually socially distancing it takes away any excuse. A force spokeswoman said a small protest took place along Hove Seafront on Monday monitored by police to ensure that it passed off without any issue. The policing role is to maintain law and order and protect public safety. We cannot enforce social distancing by law by encouraging people to do so. The protest came after plans of a mass gathering on Brighton and Hove Seafront on Saturday, with a poster organising the event being circulated on social media. On Friday, in response to news that there could be a protest, the police said, we are aware of a planned mass gathering in Brighton this Saturday. While under normal circumstances, we fully support the right to protest peacefully during the current pandemic, this right is superseded by the right to life in line with the new public health regulations. But yet they still allowed it to go ahead, even though that right is secondary to the right to life. Anyone planning or promoting protests should be aware that if these activities result in protest activity, any participants may make themselves liable to police engagement and enforcement. Yesterday, regarding Monday's protest, the police added, we applied our usual policing approach of engaging with those involved in a protest, explaining the government restrictions in, in relation to gathering and encouraged them to socially distance to help prevent the spread of coronavirus. We will use the enforcement options available to us in a proportionate way and only as a last resort if they do not comply. Isn't it a shame that the police in Hyde Park didn't take a similar approach? The government, in traditional fashion, is blaming others for their mistakes. 
blaming their own scientific advisors. The government have said that they, they've given them wrong advice on tackling coronavirus. Mainstream media is alleging that the coronavirus death toll is more than 44,000. Although, remember that many of these died with coronavirus and not from coronavirus. Therese Coffey, the Work and Pension Secretary, was asked on Tuesday if, in hindsight, the government had got it wrong. She said, if the science was wrong, advice at the time was wrong. I'm not surprised if people will then think we made a wrong decision. We are getting advice from the scientists, she said. It is for ministers to decide on policy. We have tried to take every step of the way, making sure that we listen to the science, understand the science and make decisions based on that. Adrian Smith, said to be one of the UK's top scientists, said that the danger is if the politicians keep saying we're simply doing what the scientists tell us. That could be awkward. Politicians ultimately must make the decisions, said Smith, a statistician and the incoming president of the Royal Society, one of the UK's most prominent scientific academies. There will be a post-mortem on this, but I think the use of science and the re-establishment of experts is something that won't go away. And I think it won't be the backlash that, you know, the scientists got it wrong. So, how long now before politician turns on politician? Again, which is always an attempt to muddy the waters and make it harder for the public to know and understand what's really going on. I've said it before, I'll say it again. The only way to deal with this is to simply stop electing people to act on our behalf. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 20, says that everyone has the right to take part in the government of his country, directly or through freely chosen representatives, and that the will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of the government. This will shall be expressed in periodic and genuine elections, which shall be by universal and equal suffrage and shall be held by secret vote or the equivalent free voting procedures. So we all have the right to take part in government. The simple reason we have elected officials is because it's easier for the government to deal with. Why should we make it easy for them whilst simultaneously making it more difficult for us? Think about it. A big thank you, of course, to channel Patreon supporters. Your support is truly, truly appreciated. And that's all I have for you today. Please like, share, comment and subscribe. Let me know your thoughts, as I know many of you will. And until next time, stay safe, look after each other, film the police and other officials. Good night, all. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you like the content and you'd like to help support the channel, you can do so. In the description of every video, there are some links to ways that you're able to help support the channel so I can continue putting out content. If you're unable to help us in that way, hit that subscribe button up the top there. If you haven't already, become a subscriber. That is support enough. Share the videos, comment, like, it all helps. If you're looking for something else to watch, up top there is my latest video. Down the bottom there is a video that YouTube recommends for you.